If you were being hunted by six terrifying monsters and each one wanted to kill you in horrible ways, what would you do? I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat every monster in scary stories to tell in the dark. These kids are about to be hunted down by pure evil. It's Halloween night, and they're here to explore an abandoned house. Rumor has it that this place is haunted by the ghost of a child killer, but when this kid Augie learns that children were murdered here, he refuses to go inside. His friend Ramon isn't scared and insists they walk inside to check it out, but they're about to discover a dark secret that will haunt them for the rest of their lives. The others go upstairs while these two explore the kitchen, and Ramon here notices these grooves on the wall. With the girl's help, they push the shelf aside, revealing a hidden door behind it. Walking through, Stella looks through the items around them, and she begins to realize that these are the possessions of Sarah Bellos, the murderer who lived here 70 years ago. Legend goes that she lured children into the house with her scary stories, and used poison to murder anyone who came by. The legend says that now her spirit haunts this place, and if someone comes here at night asking Sarah to tell them a story, it will be the last one they ever hear. Okay, nothing about this is a good idea. If you ever have a friend that pressures you to break into a haunted house on Halloween night, you should tell him to go f himself. Now, even if you don't believe in ghosts or the supernatural, there's still plenty of reason to be scared out of your mind. It's a statistical fact that on the night of Halloween, children are three times more likely to be killed, which makes it the deadliest day of the year for anyone under the age of 17. The reason has nothing to do with ghosts or goblins, but if that doesn't scare enough common sense into you to seriously reconsider your plans on October 31st, then you're putting your life in the cold-blooded hands of natural selection. These kids are going to realize that visiting this haunted house was their worst mistake, which is exactly how I feel when I'm at the bank. And that's why this video's sponsor, Current, is giving away $5,000 to you for signing up to their app. So you don't ever have to feel that way again. Guys, Current, if you don't know already, is the future of banking. No hidden fees, no hidden anything, no bull****. It's so easy to use. They ship you this sleek looking card, and the rest you can manage any way that you want on your phone, with every feature you could ask for. Early paychecks, instant notifications, basically all the tech the bank should have built a long time ago, Current already has and does it better in every way. And the best part is, not only by using the app do you get rewards like free cash back, Current is literally paying my viewers just to sign up. Guys, this is literally the best sponsor I've ever had, and I cannot be more excited that Current and I are giving away $5,000. Use my link in the description, current.com slash howtobeat, to download the app and use current code howtobeat, and in the next couple of weeks, we will be sending 10 random people $500 each. I definitely recommend you sign up with Current. Even if you don't get the $500 reward this time around, a lot of you signing up will make them happy enough to sponsor me again, and you or a friend might get it the next time. So big thanks to Current Empowering Creators, and big thank you to you guys for showing them some love in return using my link in the description. Meanwhile, the other kids are exploring the second floor, and Charlie here gets an idea. He runs to hide in a closet so he can scare his friend Augie, but when he peeks through the doors, he's shocked to find the room has completely changed, and there in the middle of the floor is a woman sitting on a bed. Freaking out, he closes the door, but hears footsteps approaching him. Suddenly, the closet doors burst open, and his friend finds him standing there terrified. Charlie walks out asking where the old lady has gone, but his friend has no idea what he's talking about. Realizing the house is haunted, he tells Augie they need to leave and runs downstairs to find their friends. The boys find the others inspecting the secret room, and that's when Stella here takes an old book off the shelf. It belongs to none other than Sarah Bellows, the child killer. Scared out of his mind, Charlie insists they should put it back, but suddenly the door behind them slams shut and all the candles go out. The local bully has followed them to the house and locked everyone inside. His girlfriend demands that they let the kids out because her brother is in there and goes to set them free. But as she opens the door, the bully pushes her down the stairs and closes it. Now she's trapped in with the others and they're all going to die if they don't find a way out of here. As the kids start to panic, Stella here asks the ghost to tell her a story just like in the legend. And that's when a shadowy hand reaches out and unlocks the bolt. Walking through the door, the group is surprised to find no one on the other side, but are so glad to be free that they don't realize they've just been saved by a ghost. Okay, this is getting freaky, because nobody was around to set them free, and we can't explain how a lock like this could have opened on its own. 
If the kids had looked closely, they would have realized that this bolt recedes at least an inch into the door, and it's also up against a wall-mounted dish rack, making for a very tight corner. So there's virtually no way for something to fall down and push the lock two inches to the left to open it. This leaves no room for any natural explanation. And since we're already in a haunted house, we need to strongly consider that this is most likely the result of paranormal activity. Now, if this sounds unscientific, recent studies have suggested that certain locations might actually be haunted for real. According to the study, if a location already has several reports of paranormal activity and someone who isn't aware of those reports visits the haunted location, they are statistically much more likely to experience paranormal phenomena than anywhere else. This doesn't prove ghosts exist, but it's a strong correlation of circumstances and it should be enough to make you scared shitless about visiting a haunted house in the middle of the night. In the majority of cultures across the world, a ghost is defined as the spirit of someone who has died and refuses to leave. But what's interesting here is that they must anchor themselves to the real world by binding to a person, place, or object. Now since this book belongs to the girl who died here, there's a very high chance that the book itself could be the anchor that's holding Sarah Bellow's spirit. These kids will soon realize that taking this book out of the house was a huge mistake, because it's going to summon six terrifying monsters to hunt them down and kill them. At home, Stella here takes out the book she stole from the mansion and opens it to read the scary stories inside. But there's one that catches her eye. She wipes the page, but the words smear, and she realizes that the letters were recently written in fresh blood. The story describes a boy who hated a scarecrow, but it came to life and murdered him. Meanwhile, across town, Tommy here is doing chores on his parents' farm and passes by the scarecrow, but doesn't realize that this is the first monster they're going to face. He walks further into the field looking over his shoulder, but when he turns back around, the straw man is right in front of him, standing on his own two feet. He falls to the ground in shock and watches as it starts to come alive before his eyes. It's scary as hell, and the bully runs away, screaming for his mommy as the scarecrow chases after him. He trips on a pitchfork laying in the dirt, and seeing the monster getting closer, he decides to face it head on. Standing his ground, the kid stabs a scarecrow in the stomach, but it doesn't even flinch. The monster yanks it out of its own body and rams it straight into the kid's guts before ripping the pitchfork back out. The bully stumbles away in shock and tries to call for help, but suddenly he starts coughing up hay and straw begins to grow out of his wounds. There's nothing he can do to save himself, and he collapses to the ground as he slowly transforms into a scarecrow. That's one down and five to go. Okay. This death could have easily been avoided if he hadn't made one critical mistake. First of all, this scarecrow has been possessed by something supernatural, so there's no logical reason to think that we can kill it the same way we would kill a human. This thing is made out of wood and hay, so stabbing him in the stomach with a pitchfork is an incredibly stupid thing to do here. Now, we still have to stop it because if we just run away, he might follow us into the house and kill everyone inside. The best chance we have of surviving is to knock it over to limit its movements, and from there, it's a much weaker threat that we can overpower. Based on the physical structure of this scarecrow, there's no way it would be able to maneuver itself into a standing position, and with one simple push, Tommy could have defeated the scarecrow with his eyes closed. From there, I would drag it out of the field and set him on fire. The scarecrow's spine is a single column of wood, so he can't even arch his back without breaking himself in half. If Tommy here had taken a moment to consider the physical limitations of his enemy, he would still be alive. The next day, the girl shows her friends the story about the scarecrow, and she thinks it's connected to Tommy, the bully who went missing last night. Charlie here believes she might be right, and tells them all about the woman he saw in the haunted house, but their friend thinks they're getting carried away with ghost stories. Wanting to prove him wrong, Stella and Ramon go to the cornfield where the bully disappeared, and they realize that the scarecrow is now wearing the same clothes as the missing kid. The girl thinks that this is not a coincidence, and whatever happens in the book happens in real life. Her friend Ramon insists she's freaking out over nothing, but he has no idea that tonight they're going to encounter the second monster, and it's even more dangerous than the last. Later that day, Stella decides to take the book back to the haunted house. If these stories are coming true, then she wants no part of it and hopes to put a stop to this curse. But when she returns home that night, the girl is shocked to find her friend reading from the exact same book. Somehow, it's returned back to her room and the boy found it laying on the desk. Confused, she opens up the pages and sees a new story appear called The Big Toe, as words begin to write themselves into the book. She drops it in horror as they both watch her write out the story of someone who eats a stew full of human body parts. That's when she realizes the story is of her friend Augie and grabs the walkie-talkie, desperate to make sure he's still alive. 
Okay, this is instantly terrifying, because Augie here has no idea he's about to be killed, and they can't reach him in time to warn him. Since there's no other way to intervene, I would try to use the book's own powers to our advantage to save our friend. From what we've observed, it looks like these stories are written in blood, so I would draw my own blood and modify the story, saying that Augie ran away and the monster wasn't able to kill him. This might give us a chance to use the book's power against itself and nobody will die. Now, if it doesn't work, then we'll have one less friend and that's sad. But on the bright side, we won't have to send as many Christmas cards at the end of the year. If it does work, however, then this gives us the superpower of a death note, but with pure creative freedom to make anything we could ever want. For example, we could write our own story about a monster that killed other monsters to protect us, but we also might be able to write a message to the ghost of Cerebellos and try to communicate with her. Since she's made it clear that we can't get rid of the book and we're stuck with it, then we need to convince her that we are willing to work with her. If Sarah doesn't consider us to be a threat, then our lives will be spared and we'll be able to enjoy the powers of the book with a lot fewer consequences. At the end of the day, it's better to be the devil's advocate than to be the devil's plaything, and I'm prepared to do just about anything if I think it has a chance of saving me and my friends' lives. Across town, Augie here is starving and opens his fridge to find a huge pot of stew waiting for him. He's about to dig into his last meal when the connection on the walkie-talkie finally comes through and he answers it. His friends warn him that his name just appeared in the book and it's writing out a death story Taylor made for him, but he thinks it's just a dumb prank. Annoyed and hungry, Augie puts down the radio and shoves a spoonful of stew into his mouth, but then he feels something strange and pulls out a huge rotten toe. It's disgusting and he tips the whole pot onto the floor, realizing that his friends were right. He runs upstairs to his room, but he's just made the biggest mistake of his life. On the other side of the door, a rotting woman slowly walks through the hallway and she's missing her big toe. He tries to open the window, but it won't budge, and now he's trapped with no way to escape. Hiding under the bed, Augie can only watch in terror as his door starts to slowly creak open, but no one comes in. Thinking he's safe, he crawls out to see if the coast is clear, but that's when the boy is suddenly pulled back under the bed and finds the rotten woman right above him. The kid tries to save himself, but she's too strong and he disappears into the darkness. Later, Stella and Ramon arrive and run into the room looking for their friend, but the only thing they find are the scratches he left on the floor. That's two down and four to go. Okay, that's the last time I'm ever eating my mom's leftovers, but this wasn't even the biggest mistake that the kid made. When Augie here realized that a monster was coming to kill him, the first thing he did was run deeper into his house and crawl under the bed. This has got to be the absolute worst place to hide, because once you're found, there's nowhere for you to run. It's a death sentence, and the better option would have obviously been to break the window to escape. Now, if he managed to escape the house and the monster still followed him outside, he'd be a lot more likely to find someone to help him kill it. There were fewer gun laws in 1968 than there are now, so there's a good chance that several of his neighbors are gun owners. If he passed enough houses screaming for help, somebody is bound to show up just waiting for an opportunity like this to defend the streets of America. If this kid doesn't have any way to kill the monster himself, he can let the Second Amendment do it for him. It also helps that this monster is missing its big toe, so it'll be much slower than the average human. The mechanics of running requires you to use your toes for balance, and you would fall flat on your face if you tried to run without them. As long as we can run and stay ahead of it, then we'll be able to buy ourselves a lot more time to figure out a way to kill it. The next day, the group meets up and the others learn about what happened to their friend Augie. He's disappeared without a trace, and the same will happen to each of them when their own story is written, but the friends have an idea. Placing the book in a metal barrel, they light it on fire to destroy it for good. But when they dump out the ashes, they discover that the book is completely unburnt. There's nothing they can do to get rid of it, and Stella here realizes that they need to research the owner of the book, Sarah Bellows, before someone else dies. They go to the local newspaper outlet, and Charlie here finds an old paper saying that Sarah died at a mental hospital, and after her death, the surviving family members began to mysteriously disappear. Stella here checks the book, and realizes that each member of the Bellows family has their own deadly story. As the girl flips through the pages, the title of a new story appears called The Red Spot, and Charlie's big sister is next to die. That night, this girl Ruth is trying to pop a massive zit on her cheek, but behind her, a ghostly shadow starts to stretch across the bathroom ceiling. That's when she sees something move under the skin, and suddenly hundreds of spiders come bursting out of her face. The girl starts to freak out, and when the friends finally reach her, they find her screaming on the floor in terror with spiders crawling everywhere. This kid douses her with a bucket of water, and they manage to save the sister's life. But that's now two down, one saved, and there are three more friends to go. Okay. 
this was a close call. But the big takeaway here is that now we know we can intervene in these death stories. Since we can read the story being written before it happens, then as long as we stay in the group, we will have several minutes in advance to plan for whatever monster is coming next. If you don't stay in the group, then you won't know how you'll die, and nobody will be able to help you fight it off or run away, so splitting up at any point before your story is written is going to be a huge risk. Now, this isn't the only help that we can get to guarantee our safety. Taking the book to the police is definitely the right move here. The cops will think you are a prime suspect in two separate murder cases, because there's literally a record of the murders in this book written in blood. But that's actually not a bad thing. First of all, there's an easy way to prove that this book is supernatural, because if they wait long enough and you make them watch, eventually it will go after a new victim and they'll be able to see the book writing in itself. We can also easily demonstrate to them that nothing can destroy this book, which breaks the laws of physics and they'll have no choice but to listen to us. Now, if they decide to ignore the proof we give them, then that's okay too. Because if we are the prime suspect in their investigation, then we'll have police surveillance watching our every move. And when a monster shows up to kill us, they might be able to save our lives. At the very least, we can lure the new monsters straight into the police and we'll get to watch our tax dollars at work. The next day, the friends visit the hospital to find records on Sarah Bellows when she was a patient here. They sneak into a restricted area and look for the red room where the older files are kept. But Charlie here doesn't want to go and is terrified that he might be next. The girl tells him to wait while they go looking, but he decides to take the elevator to get out while he still can and leaves the others behind. Meanwhile, his friends find the records room and discover the medical files of Sarah Bellows. Reading it, they learn she was admitted by her family and the doctor supervising her case was her own brother who tortured her through horrible medical treatments. The girl pulls out a wax cylinder from a can, and Ramon here recognizes that it's an audio recording. Listening to it, they hear the doctor interrogating Sarah, demanding she confess to poisoning the children. The woman insists that mercury from the family's paper mill spilled into the water supply, and Ramon here realizes her own family was framing her for crimes she didn't commit. That's when she suddenly starts telling a story about their friend Charlie, and terrified, they realize that he's next to die if they don't save him. Upstairs, Charlie is completely lost and tries to find an exit when all of a sudden an alarm goes off as the hospital's lights turn red. Reaching an intersection, he sees a fat pill figure walking towards him at the end of the hallway and runs in the opposite direction, but the same figure is at the other end too. Everywhere he goes, there's no escape as the monster appears at the end of every corridor and slowly gets closer. Finally, they surround him on all sides and the pale lady embraces the boy, absorbing him into her body. It's horrifying, and there's nothing he can do to escape. By the time his friends arrive, he's vanished, and the only thing left is his pen. That's three down, one saved, and two to go. Okay, this monster is scary as hell. She's like that great aunt that you only see on family reunions, and you can't do anything to avoid her suffocating hugs. Now, if we don't panic, we can survive this pretty easily if we use our time wisely to observe our surroundings and find things to use to our advantage. First of all, there are a lot of rooms in this hallway, and it's worth looking to find if any of them have a window to break and escape out of. If it's looking like none of the rooms have windows, then the next best thing is to get through the monster by going above her through this ventilation shaft. It probably wouldn't be too difficult to find tables and chairs in some of these rooms, so I would try to gather as many as I could find into the middle of the hallway intersection. Then I would line them up so that I'm on a platform above them. The tables will stop them from being able to reach me, and it buys me time to try and loosen the grate of this ventilator shaft to crawl in and make my way out of the building. Now, if we can't manage to open the ventilation, we're already at least two and a half feet above them and could easily jump over the monster in any direction we wanted. As long as we continue to cordon off the threat, we can search for an exit without getting hugged to death by Great Aunt Berta. That night, Stella and Ramon are taken to the police station after being caught in the hospital. The sheriff asks them what they know about the missing children, and they tell him about the book and its powers, but he doesn't believe them. The man will let them go without some proper answers, so they stay the night in jail. This is the worst possible place they could be, because another monster is coming, and there's nowhere for them to run. Later, the sheriff sees a new story has appeared in the book, and asks the kids about it, but they're interrupted as all the lights in the station go out. His dog begins growling at a noise in the other room, so the sheriff goes to investigate. But something suddenly falls out of the chimney, and the cop realizes it's a severed head. The head starts to move, and the sheriff immediately shoots at it until he's all out of ammo, but more severed body parts start falling from the chimney, assembling themselves into a disgusting rotten corpse. The monster snaps the sheriff's neck and throws his body into the jail bars before crawling through the holding room to find the kids. 
he tries pushing himself through the bars of Ramon's cell, but the girl grabs the keys from the sheriff's belt and runs over to help set both of them free before the monster can get inside. They leave the station and find a squad car to escape with, but that's when the boy tells Stella to go to the haunted house without him. He suggests that she talks to the ghost so she can finally end this curse while he draws off the monster, and she agrees to the plan. Splitting up from his friend, the boy drives off in the squad car as the creature chases after him. Suddenly, the monster lands on the hood of the vehicle and tries to break into the car. Ramon here rams the creature into a semi-truck and traps it between the hood before running away to the haunted house. But he's still in danger. Breaking apart, the monster escapes the vehicles and reassembles itself to continue hunting the boy down. Okay, this is easily the deadliest monster so far, but it's not just because they were locked in jail with nowhere to go. First of all, these kids could have done a much better job of convincing the cop that this book is supernatural. All they would have needed to do was try destroying the book in front of him and the cop would have seen that it was impossible. This is enough proof that something strange is going on, but he didn't realize this until it was too late. This cop emptied his gun straight into the monster's head and it didn't even flinch. That means this creature can't be killed through brute force and we need to outthink it in order to survive. He's also the first monster that runs faster than a human, so even if we manage to break out of jail, we still can't outrun it, and that seriously limits our options. We're going to need to beat this monster right here in the police station if we want any chance to survive, so we need to first consider its physical limitations and try using them against it. Now, this monster's greatest strength is also its greatest weakness. This creature can detach its body parts, which is really badass. But if that's how it was put together, then it's probably going to be a lot more vulnerable around those connecting points. This gives us a way to limit its ability to harm or chase us down. If it were me, instead of trying to escape, I would wait until he's trapped between the bars and have Stella try to steal one of its limbs while I try to tear off its head from its body. If we manage to separate its limbs and head and then run away with them, then it won't be able to run and chase us, and his corpse won't be able to see where it's going. Then, we can take the stolen body parts out to the middle of the nearest lake, tie them to a brick, and watch them sink to the bottom. The monster will be so preoccupied with finding and retrieving his messy body parts that we'll have plenty of time to escape and solve the mystery of the storybook before he ever finds us again. Reaching the haunted house, Stella here begs Sarah Bella's ghost to stop killing her friends, explaining that they now know she was framed and never committed any crimes. That's when she hears footsteps walking upstairs, and all of a sudden she finds herself transported to the past years before the house was ever abandoned. Moments later, Ramon here arrives at the mansion searching for his friend, when he finds the girl's book at the bottom of the stairs, and sees a new story being written for Stella. Suddenly, he hears noises outside and realizes the monster has caught up to him. He runs upstairs and finds a room to hide in, shutting the door behind him as the monster chases him up the stairwell. In the past, Stella hears a man calling out for Sarah Bellows. Afraid, she runs upstairs and shuts herself inside of a room to hide, but that's when the girl catches her reflection in the mirror. She walks up to take a closer look and realizes that she looks exactly like Sarah, the owner of the storybook. Freaking out, she runs out the door and through the hallway until she finds the dining room. With nowhere left to go, she hides under the table hoping no one will find her, but that's when everything goes wrong. She stays as quiet as she can, but the Bellows family finds her and drags her out of hiding. They carry her through the house and back into the secret room where Sarah, the owner of the storybook, was kept prisoner. Meanwhile, in the present, Ramon here looks around for an exit and falls all the way to the ground level, spraining his ankle in the process. Suddenly, a voice screams out from the secret room, and he limps over to rescue his friend. But that's when he sees something above him and finds the monster hanging from the ceiling. The creature quarters him against the floor and is about to finish him off, but Stella is about to save everyone's life. That's when the girl senses something is in the room and finally sees the ghost of Sarah Bellows sitting in the chair across from her. This time, Stella isn't afraid and tells the ghost that if she kills her and her friends, then she's no better than how her own family treated her. Stella promises to tell the truth about Sarah to the world, and the spirit offers a pen to write the truth into the book. Stella writes the ghost's true story with her own blood, and the ghost suddenly lets out a terrifying scream. Sarah Bellows has finally let go of her anger and lifts the curse. Suddenly, the monster releases Ramon and falls to pieces on the floor. He limps towards the secret room and opens the door to find Stella, and the last two survivors embrace each other in relief, thankful to still be alive. But what do you think? How would you beat scary stories to tell in the dark? Let me know with a comment down below. Thank you so much for watching, leave a like and subscribe, and check out the How to Beat playlist for more videos like this. Until next time, have a damn good day.